Hello, good evening. Thank you for being here with us um, in celebration of Rebecca Mendez Selux, the 17th installment in this series in which designers, artists, architects, and public figures are invited to guest curate an exhibition from their vision. Um, and if you have ever seen a Selex exhibition here before, you'll know that every iteration is different. Um, and Rebecca really took um, this show, I think, in a direction that we've never seen before. So today we'll talk a bit about um, Rebecca as a designer, as an artist, as a curator, um, as a teacher, um, and we'll also talk about uh, the process of putting together a show, which for many people, um, the process of doing an exhibition at any museum is very difficult, <laughs> um, quite multifaceted, and, um, and it takes a village, as I like to say. And Rebecca was a, a true champ in navigating our system, and um, it was such an honor to work with her. Um, I joined Cooper Hewitt two years ago. This was my first exhibition project. Uh, I didn't know Rebecca. Rebecca surely didn't know me. And when we first talked about, well, when I first invited her, um, the first thing she said to me was, yes. I'm terrified, and I'm scared, but I'm so excited, and I can't wait to start. And she brought that enthusiasm in every step of the process. So um, I'll just start a bit with an uh, introduction to Rebecca, a, a few lines about her. Um, Rebecca Mendez was born in Mexico City. In 1996, she founded Rebecca Mendez Design, a multidisciplinary design studio in Los Angeles. Her design research and practice is in brand strategy and design, architectural immersive spaces, experience design, and book design. Currently, she is a professor in the Department of Design, Media, and Arts, and the director of the Counterforce Lab at UCLA. And many of her students are here, too, um, who are great fans of her. Um, in 2012, she was the recipient of the National Design Award for Communications here at Cooper Hewitt, and she also received the Medal of AIGA. But Rebecca is also um, a prolific artist and filmmaker, and so we want to start really by having her speak a bit about her process and, and how this work really helped inform um, Rebecca Mendez Selects. Thank you, Christina. That is such a beautiful introduction. And I, you are also the, an amazing person that everything that I would recommend or say or propose, you also immediately would say yes. And so I think that these uh, could, could, could have been quite dangerous. I think that will tell you about where we went. And yeah, two yeses together are pretty much exponential. So that was, it was a, a pleasure to work with you. So one of the things that I wanted to start with was, um, in order to contextualize a little bit, is what is it that motivates me and my work? And, and, and again, why is it that I ended up doing something in relation to, um, in the show, of our conflicted relationship to animals? So I will start um, but just going into what matters to me in terms of the natural world. So um, I was born and raised in Mexico City, as Christina said, to uh, parents trained as chemical engineers who are right now in front. And I have my niece, also an environmental engineer. Look at this. This is my family, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so when, um, you know, they definitely put a lot of energy into in, in the travels that we had and expeditions that you will hear a little bit about, but it was more that they instilled in me the love for the natural world, but more importantly, the nature of matter, of its composition, organization, its system cycles. So in a way, they taught me how to see the world from its design. 
this is the way in which I then began kind of like, it's as if that was all along inside, in, in me, and then in my first series, the At Any Given Moment series, it was what I began to explore. This kind of looking at the ways in which nature, if you, if you see one blade of grass in a, you know, multiplicity, like tons of blades of grass that have been, that are affected by wind and by light differently. They almost become something else. For me, it's as if I'm looking at this, but it also I'm looking at the ocean. So there was a kind of motion within the natural environment that was in constant becoming for me. So there was a, I mean, may I say the word transmutation, perhaps, that goes from grass to water, maybe. So this is the way that this series, I like exhibiting um, at architectural scale. Uh, this is at any given moment, fall one. Um, I shoot with 16 millimeter camera. I want to bring the materiality of the, um, of the celluloid into, you know, the work. I do think that there is a difference in which the, how the image is um, inscribed into the material. But it also, I feel that even just slowing it down at 60 frames per second, it changes the way that we see matter. I exhibited in, again, architectural scale, and I wanted to be an embodied experience. So this is at the Williamson Gallery. Um, and I think I can go through a few. I know that we are short in time, so I'll move fast. So um, another thing that why I wanted to shoot with 16 millimeter is because then the apparatus and I were like co-authors. Um, I don't control everything, and I love chance that happens every time that I shoot and every time that I, you know, also I'm working with new technologies. This is Piedras Negras, Yo Keep, in Guatemala. This was, um, uh, it, you can see Chuck, the god of, I think that's a pointer there, god of the rain. And we used to, as a family, we used to camp for sometimes a month in the jungle, and I would be surrounded by the oscillating uh, sound of the cicadas, by the holler monkeys, and by this multiplicity of life, there was something about this vibrant matter that was just um, the way that we grew up. And in these expeditions, my father would use as a guide um, the text and the books by Lloyd um, uh, Stevens, um, John Lloyd Stevens, um, an American diplomat explorer, and then Catherwood, Catherwood, a British uh, architect. And he began to create these most beautiful um, drawings of the, um, uh, of the sites, of archaeological sites. So my father would follow that. And, uh, and again, it's like we couldn't fit this one in our cabinet. So it ended up being X'd. But that was a, an important one. Also, I was taught about photography and how these were done by utilizing the camera lucida. So these experiences of, of, of living in the jungle and taking you know, um, uh, carbon from our campground and making rubbings, it began to make me be fascinated with also the symbolic system that was left behind by our ancestors. And here we are only two weeks ago, three weeks ago with my dad, we are in Chicana which 45 years ago, we camped exactly right there. Uh, it would take us like three days to go through the jungle to get there. Now it's two hours, still in a dirt road. But there, my dad was looking at exactly where mom and dad had their camping tent, mm -hmm. looking through the gate of the serpent. Chicana means gate of the serpent. It's in um, the reserve of Calakmul. Um, which then brings, brings me to why then I love this exploration and artistic field work. Um, so far, um, I have s arrived at that, that what I love doing the most and what fascinates me the most is artistic field work. What it is is that, you know, just the same way that you go into a scientist, for example, can be in the lab or can be in the field, an artist can be in the studio and can be in the field. And the chance that happens when you are actually exposed to the elements, it is amazing. I love being there. I love having that presence. And what I like about the artistic fieldwork is that then you, and I think that this one we could be going to. Oh, yes. 
another expedition in the Arctic. This is um, in Svalbard, in, the, um, in Moffin Island, the Arctic Circle expedition. But it's that artistic fieldwork borrows from various disciplines. It could be from you know, uh, environmental science, uh, geography, graphic design, literature. And you end up creating, like having that, the research that, the scientific research that seems quite objective, it is somehow then combined with the flexibility and fluidity of the artistic practice. And then your artifacts can be from a film to a book to a brand to whatever it is is necessary for you to tell your story. So that is what I love the most doing. Um, sometimes I keep very detailed um, uh, sketchbooks of um, the expeditions. This is my equipment list. This is where we were. And I didn't mean to change it, and I changed it. But that's OK. <laughs> I think that we are in a hurry. <laughs> so I think that's maybe OK. Um, so anyway, I think that the idea of um, when I was in this expedition, I was reading Gender in Ice, and it was about the um, uh, exploration to the North Pole and the conquest of the North Pole. To me, that also speaks a lot about the issues of um, imperialism in our current time as well. So this was in the last um, uh, site that we went in the sailboat around Svalbard. This is called Abandoned. And I thought, well, why don't I conquer the North Pole for Mexico? Right? It's like, what can be more absurd than that? And at the same time, it was when um, I'm thinking a lot about, um, it was in 2007 that a member of parliament, a Russian member of parliament, takes a, goes into with the sub submarine and goes underneath the ice cap. Now that it is melting due to climate change, everybody's beginning to claim what it is underneath. And so he goes and plants a flag, a Russian flag, um, to claim the land for them. So this is my response to that and um, I do come back <laughs> and I, we might accelerate but anyway what this did is that it gave me also a sense of understanding that what I love to do is being there present so it is is like the journey as a medium in itself walking as a way of being able to relate to uh, my environment and uh, just be able to Again, create sometimes actions and, uh, and, and address issues of, again, for me in this case, um, colonialism. Um, I thought also about the way in which the dream of the migrants of going to the north for a better life and then the realities of being very, very complex is much more, there's an ambivalence there. And so I was also looking at this ambivalence that one goes with a glorious desire to own and control and <laughs> it doesn't always happen, it doesn't always work. So I think that that to me just shows truly that kind of ambivalence of, of, um, of conquer, of conquest. But then again more of the artistic field where walking for example became a piece. This is a piece that will, I will continue to do as long as I can walk <laughs> until I die maybe even. But I want to be able to have this, you know, I call it walking the earth. And um, it's um, walking is analogous to speech, the speech act. There is a sense of syntax. There is a, like you're articulating with how you're encountering the earth. So that was something that to me was a, uh, I want to be doing that for ever. So Circumsolar is a project about migration, interspecificity, and extinction, and that really means uh, interspecies relationships, interspecies friendships. So um, I, uh, Circumsolar is born from my love for the Arctic tern, which is a small seabird that weighs less than your iPhone or your phone, and that has the longest migration recorded of any creature. It goes from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back again every year. 
It is, uh, it's about 90,000 kilometers, uh, 60,000 miles. They uh, do a solo flight and they mate for life. So they come back again. Uh, they live about 35 years. And so for me, there was something so powerful about the, the termination of this Arctic turn. This was the first time that I encountered the Arctic turn in Iceland in 2006. It wasn't until about maybe six years ago, eight years ago, that they were able to put uh, geolocators in the, um, in the birds, and they were so tiny that they couldn't really transmit information, but they had, they had to catch them back again to understand the voyage, the, the, the journey of the Arctic turn. Um, it goes from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Here it is, its trajectory. Uh, we, I think that downstairs is the poster. You can actually read the text yeah. there. So that, um, I will speed up through this. But um, it is just incredible that they are primarily pelagic, go through the center, but that's, that's what they were able to find. And recent um, research has, um, uh, I was working with, a, in 2012, um, Dr. Freydis, Figus dotir, figus dotir, right? That was right. Um, Icelandic ornithologist um, arrived to the, uh, her research showed that 90% of the chicks are dying out of a starvation. That is true to all, sea, all seabirds. Uh, no matter what you, where you look at, the seabirds are the canary in the coal mine of the effects of climate change. I followed a couple of chicks and uh, they, because of the waters around the Arctic, they have warmed about one degree. The mackerel and other fish come sooner, and they eat the sand eel, which is what puffins eat, the Arctic tern eats. The chicks have such tiny beaks that they cannot eat anything else. So um, I guess to me, the interest of doing this work is being able to understand the determination of this bird and because I feel that humanity has lost its clarity of how to survive as a species. Um, so I am, with this work, entering into truly becoming with and becoming with another species. And here is the making kin, very much Donna Haraway kind of idea of making kin with another species. So I'll continue to find this little creature. And this was exhibited... Um, the video, this uh, a video of 26 minute video at GLOW in 2013 at Lo in Los Angeles and brings me here. So, so when Rebecca, the first phone call I had with, her, with Rebecca, she says, I want to do something focused on animals and extinction. And I said, oh, this is great. Every, it was, it was a, a meeting, um, a conference call with the Cooper Hewitt team. Everyone was so excited about this theme that Rebecca um, had honed in on. And then I didn't hear from Rebecca for four months. And I would send <laughs> Rebecca emails, and it was just silence. And, um, and then this was late late in 2017, so going into the beginning of 2018, I write Rebecca and I say, Rebecca, if I don't hear from you, I'm not sure if this is going to be the show that you want it to be. And then that got her to respond. But <laughs> what I want to say is really that um, Rebecca takes on every project um, very much like the field work that she does. She's all in. So if she's concentrated on one project, she, she really cannot be, she's not distracted. She doesn't allow herself to be distracted by other things, um, which is a really interesting and a lovely way to work because when we spent our time together, she was so hyper-focused on the work that we were doing and it really helped us move um, the narrative along of the show in a way that I certainly didn't expect um, that we were able to sort of, you know, tighten it up uh, as quickly as, as we did. Um, putting a show together, as I mentioned, is, is quite demanding. Um, and not only was it, is it demanding for someone who's never worked in a museum or with a collection, we had decided very early on that we would do an exhibition that had specimens from the National Museum of Natural History. And that for us was really 
what would distinguish this show from others. Mm -hmm. um, but Smithsonian is quite large. Um, it's based, it's a, the biggest research institution in the world. It has multiple units. Um, I had you know, barely made a year working at Cooper Hewitt. I had no idea who to contact. And, um, and our first conversation really started with Martha. I didn't know that Rebecca had been working on this project on Martha the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon is an extinct species of bird. Um, the last passenger pigeon uh, passed away at the Cincinnati Museum and interestingly was immediately put in a 300 pound block of ice, put on a train and shipped to Smithsonian. And this was gonna be the star of Rebecca's show. <laughs> the last passenger pigeon on earth. Um, and I didn't know at the time, but she was working on a project. Do you wanna talk a bit about this project? Yeah, yeah, so for the Cincinnati um, uh, University, the rec center, I had designed some murals in 2006, and it was time for the murals to get like a, you know, rejuvenation. And they wanted me, they were either going to completely get rid of them or for some addition to be um, put to that. So it was, it was a strange thing, but at the same time I felt, you know, let's make, after researching so many things, I found out about Martha, who died at the zoo, and then alone by herself, single species, imagine that you're the last human <laughs> you died, you get put into a pack of ice, right? But, <laughs> and so I made this homage to Martha. And um, so I felt that I could continue then with this project on extinction and uh, get the thylacine, get the dodo. Yeah, so Rebecca responds to my email and with this. <laughs> it's get just me, give me those. <laughs> can we get these species um, extinct and, and endangered? In, right? Extinct but. and endangered. Uh, that's Martha there, perched, um, and you can find her at uh, Natural History, just like that. And these are images, snapshots from the Natural History um, installation now. And um, you know, it, it actually took me three weeks to just get a contact at Natural History. So imagine once I got that contact um, asking for these birds and the, the collections manager answered with one line, there's no way you are getting those animals. They never leave the Smithsonian. They never the leave the Smithsonian. The, and the, the special in the um, National And Museum. not even a sincerely, so sorry. Um, it's just like, that's no. it. And so I, I call Rebecca and I said, well, those aren't a go. What is plan B? And she um, talks to me about this story that she had just read. And why don't you talk a little bit about it? Because I was really moved by this plan B, which I thought was going to be something maybe more simple or, or not as complex. And I found it to be even more profound than the initial idea. Yeah, definitely. So for me, I've been reading um, author Barry Lopez um, a lot, and I love in his Crossing Open Ground book. Um, there was this passage, and I really need to, honestly, I need to read this because it's such an important one that it put in a place, it, it, it put me in it uh, from um, uh, my background. So. He writes, the image I carry of Cortes setting fire to the aviaries in Mexico City that June day of 1521 is an image I cannot rid myself of. It stands in my mind for a fundamental lapse of wisdom in the European conquests of America, an underlying trouble in which political conquest, personal greed, re uh, revenge, and national pride outweigh what is innocent, beautiful, serene, and defenseless, the birds. The incineration of these creatures 450 years ago is not something that can be rectified today. Indeed, one could argue, the same oblivious irreverence is still with us. Among those who would ravage and poison the earth to sustain the economic growth of Western societies. 
But Cortés's act can be rectified, can be transcended. It is possible to fix in the mind that heedless violence, the hysterical cries of the birds, the stench of death, to look it square in the face and say that there is more to us than this. This will not forever distinguish us among other cultures. It is possible to imagine that on the far side of Renaissance and the Enlightenment, we can recover the threads of an earlier wisdom. So this was the moment of what he's talking about is when Hernán Cortés comes to Tenochtitlan and it is written in the Bernal Díaz del Castillo, right, that they had seen the most beautiful cities of Iztapalapa and Tenochtitlan, that the synergy which with they lived and the connection to the wildlife was unparalleled. And the moment that Moctezuma realized the dubious intentions of Cortés just kicks him out, and they come back 11 months later to destroy the entire city. And of course, Moctezuma collected, had, had aviaries, thousands of birds of all the continent, and they were very, very important for the civilization. And um, yeah, they were burned alive, and the screeches are described in, in the document. So I felt that moment where two cultures collide, and that we continue to live, primarily focus on the one, continue to be the extractivist kind of culture, then it just shows that, again, we have not learned much from our ancestors in that way. And from a curatorial perspective, it was interesting that she, this was her sort of plan B, because I, I joined Cooper Hewitt two years ago as the curator of Latino design. Um, so I'm charged with helping to build a collection focused on US Latino and Latin American designers and um, historically and up to the present. And, you know, we don't have a collection, really. Um, we're working on it, and it's going to take us a long time to get there. And what this exhibition process showed us was that we could tell these stories that were unique to the region, unique to Latin American history, to Latino history, without necessarily having objects made by, by people from that area. Not to say that I don't want those objects, because I do. <laughs> but that we could venture out and tell those stories to our public um, in a way that was all-encompassing, that was um, complex, multifaceted. And so when she first you know, told me of this, of this second plan, I said, let's go for it. And, and we did. And, Part of thinking about this was obviously grounding the show in the story of, of Tenochtitlan and um, Hernán Cortés, but also talking a bit about the Aztec Empire and the importance of birds to and featherworks to the culture. Um, so we tried to do that. If, if you spend some time in the show, we tried to do that um, by centering those, uh, those documents and those objects at, at the center of, literally at the center of the room. Um, and this is just an excerpt of the brochure that Rebecca designed, which, with, which has a few um, pages from codices, which shows um, the elaborate Aztec featherworks um, that would have been worn. And then this is the first published map of Tenochtitlan in 1524, which gets published in, Neur in Nuremberg um, to accompany the first Latin translation of Hernán Cortés's letters to the Spanish crown describing Mexico um, at length. And what's so interesting about this map is that it does, this is the map, um, and it does clearly show where the birds would have lived. In the city. It was that important. It was. It would cover so much of the, of the city. So this was our starting point um, for the exhibition, and um, I said, okay, we've got a plan. And then the follow-up email was this: I want this. I want drawers, <laughs> drawers of drawers. dead birds. Yeah, and that's what Rebecca kept repeating to me. I just, I want drawers and drawers of dead birds, and I want them to look dead. I don't want them to look um, mounted or nothing. nothing dead. Um, <laughs> yes. 
imagine saying that to a design curator. I'm just saying, okay. <laughs> and, but we did it. And um, it took, this image here, I think is a great one because when we first, started, we saw this image, and I knew it was from Smithsonian Storage. Smithsonian has one of the largest bird uh, study collections in the world, and um, this image is part of a series that really looked at um, storage at the Natural History Museum. But what's so interesting about this is at the center is Roxy Laybourne. And she was an ornithologist at Smithsonian for 50 years, the first female ornithologist. Um, and there she is, surrounded by the collection, um, literally engulfed in it. And um, we thought about Roxy and, and this image, and we thought, how can we sort of bring that to life, but not quite bring it to life? Um, and um, it took some time. Uh, first, we started with the checklist. I, I sent Rebecca three books about the collection, and she would send me these updates. I would say, how's it going? Um, and she'd say, oh, it's going great. She, <laughs> she cut out um, images uh, and started to create this sort of visual board, there's her cat there, um, about how she wanted to organize the show. She took pictures of it, and then this is the this is this was her checklist. If anyone here has ever worked um, on an exhibition, and you receive this as a checklist, um, <laughs> I didn't even know where to start. Um, I printed it out on this huge piece of paper, <laughs> and we got on the phone. Um, and I remember this: the, the conversation lasted two hours. And Rebecca said, "Okay, we're going to start here. Have you found this point?" And then we literally went through it almost as if we were reading a map. Um, and that was you know, our initial start to, especially for me, to understand what Rebecca was thinking, what does she want, how does she want to organize the show. Um, part of working with, on exhibitions with a living artist is is listening and understanding. You really need to understand what they want, what their vision is, because if you're not on the same page, it just doesn't work. Um, so I spent a lot of time just listening to Rebecca, and she's so eloquent and captivating. It was really easy for me to say yes, and very hard for me to say no to her um, while we were doing the show. From, from this, I made this, which was more pared down, thinking about um, uh, sections. And, and then finally, we, we made a plan for Rebecca to come to New York. About 50 people were involved in making this show happen. In that one intimate room, 50 people were involved, at least. Um, so it really did take the effort of so many departments. And one of the first things we did was go to the library. And I, I told the librarians, we're doing the show. We're interested in seeing some, some rare books that have some bird illustrations. And the librarian said, oh, yes, I, I think I have a few options. Um, and it was, I don't know, a 20-foot table full, filled with um, with books, um, and we spent a whole morning um, just looking, and you can see how excited we were. Everyone was just taking pictures of all of these beautifully illustrated books. Um, and then obviously looking at objects, uh, we really, well, I took out the most elaborate bird cages that we had in storage. <laughs> um, the Hewitt sisters, who are, who are the founders of the Cooper Hewitt collection, loved bird cages. We have quite the collection. I brought out this very elaborate bird cage for Rebecca, who quickly said, this is not the bird cage. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then obviously other objects that we saw and, and, um, and considered. This is a very beautiful uh, Frederick Edwin Church drawing that he made while he was in Ecuador. I really wanted this uh, for for the show, it didn't make the cut. Um, others did. This pastel 
uh, which I wasn't even sure if Rebecca was going to be interested in it. It's a 17th century pastel by a female Italian artist named Rosario Carrera, and um, it depicts the Americas as a female, bare-breasted, indigenous woman. Full of feathers. Full of feathers. <laughs> and um, we had been discussing this idea of showing um, images of the personification of, of the Americas, which was part of um, an allegorical series that was very popular in the 18th century, which depicted the four continents, the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Um, and so I had sent this to Rebecca, and she said, mm, maybe. Um, and she saw it in person, she said, yes. Yeah, there was something that was just so, it represented everything in relation to how one exoticized someone, but also beautifully made, right? So it was that ambivalence of, you know, the cliches of what the, you know, new continent uh, the, the people would look like, yeah. Um, a lot of our collection lives off-site um, in Newark, New Jersey. We took a day to go to Newark, and again, a team of people pulling objects for us, um, some things that we absolutely loved, um, such as uh, this textile that obviously made it into the show. Um, others that we thought were fun, but you know, maybe not so much for, for the exhibition. A few examples of objects that we saw, again, that didn't make the cut, but, um, but that we loved looking at and, and thought would at first make great additions. And when we saw this piece, we also pulled a few of Rebecca's works that we have in the collection. And this was one that we pulled and immediately we thought, wow, this juxtaposed with um, the pastel drawing was, was so powerful. Do you want to talk a bit about this piece? Yeah, um, this piece was done in, uh, in 1992 for um, a collection of posters in Mexico. It was a Biennale, and the subject to, to, to work with was America Now 500 Years Later. So for me, this poster was the, the first time that I was confronted with having to have a voice, a political voice or a social voice in that um, I was uh, really wanting to say something. And it was difficult because for me, for example, one of the things that I see is that identity, right? Colonialism, it is, is felt in the body. And when I came here, I was immediately kind of wanting to be, it's like, are you Chicana, Hispana, Latina, Chilanga? It's like whatever I needed to be, but it's just somehow that I needed to be categorized. So I pretty much then focus on the way in which wallpaper, right, is meant to be covered, to cover something undesirable with something nice. And so my identity, who I was, was not something that was nice. It needed to be refined. It needed to be covered with a, 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 um, a cliche of what as a Mexican I'm supposed to be. So um, anyway, for me, that was a, an important moment of um, having to express what I felt about an excess of identity and an excess of categorization. And together with that one, that again, it's the body that it is ex exoticized. That was an interesting thing. Um, again, with our cutouts, um, so we, you know, we spent the entire day essentially trying to figure out our sections, what do we want to leave, what do we want to take out. This is us at the end of our, our day, um, our curatorial assistant taking this picture of us so exhausted. Poor Rebecca, I thought she was going to fall down from <laughs> yeah. um, so many hours. And then the next day, we make it to natural history. I finally got that contact at uh, the Division of Birds and their collections manager, Chris Milensky spent the entire day with us, essentially bringing to life that Roxy Laybourne photograph for us. Um, we had no idea what to expect. And as soon as he opened up the drawers, all of us went, <gasps> "Yeah, they're really dead. They're really dead. <laughs> the interesting thing about this is that for me, the reason why it was important to, to see them 
as these taxidermied animals, these skins, is because that is the way that we, for centuries, have learned about the natural world. It is through killing it. It is through vivisection uh, rather than through observation. And so more and more we're learning that, of course, we learn so much more about a creature, about an animal, in relation and alive. Um, Audubon had to, you know, shot everything, killed everything, and then made those beautiful, beautiful uh, depictions. But so I wanted to make sure that in the show, we sh again show that ambivalence of, yes, we are looking at cadavers, little dead bodies, but you know, the smell of formaldehyde or whatever <laughs> chemicals it was, every drawer it was, whoosh, just, it was, it was powerful. Yeah. It was, it was in being in the morgue. And so as we're and looking beautiful. at these um, study skins, so something that we didn't know, you know, we sort of went in there a bit, not a bit, much, very naive and very much novices. And, um, you know, Chris really helped guide us, not just through the selection of the birds that we would have for the exhibition, but really understanding why does the museum collect these animals? How are they used today? What is the difference between this and what you see in exhibitions um, at natural history museums where the birds look alive, you know, they're taxidermy, they're mounted. Um, and it was so interesting because the, the entire time we were thinking, or our pitch to the museum was, we're melding design and science. Um, but what we found was, that it was true, which was the funny thing. Um, so much of this work is about design. It's, it, it takes a true artistry, um, a talent, to create these study specimens. Um, and what we saw was that there were ornithologists who were very, very skilled in creating and stuffing the bird and, and creating the specimen. And then there were ornithologists that were really, really bad. Yeah, no, there was one, there were some that looked like they shuffled tacos. I mean, it really is just like, they just they looked awful. And then others like Ridgeway. Perfect. I mean, just beautiful shape in that there was a beautiful craft to this. And there was, each ornithologist had, you know, a signature move in, yeah. in creating these specimens. And so as we're, we're looking at these, you know, we would open up a drawer and depending on the size of the bird, we could see anywhere from um, 10 examples to 50 examples. And the collections manager, you know, blindly could say, oh, this is, you know, this was prepared by such and such or ornithologist. And sort of by the end of the day, we were able to tell um, who were, you know, um, the, the ornithologists who had prepared some of these specimens. Um, but these are really meant for study. They're never meant to be on view. They're, they're still used today. A lot of these specimens is what has helped scientists um, in conservation efforts. So in using these sorts of um, these sorts of specimens in the show, we had to talk about this tension between the collecting of these sorts of birds, um, how that collect the 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 process of collecting has been um, has changed in the twentieth century, um, and the sorts of rules and regulations and ethics that have now been put in place, as opposed to sort of the mass. Um, collecting and, and killing that was going on in the 19th century. And we have a combination of both. We certainly have objects or birds such as the Quetzal, which um, dates back to 1895. And then we have other object, uh, other birds that um, were collected as early as, um, you know, the 1990s um, or as presently as the 1990s. And now the way those specimens come into the collection is um, varied. Uh, sometimes they die from natural causes. Sometimes they do go on ex expeditions um, to collect, um, but certainly not in the way that they used to. Um, but this was all things that we, that we learned while we spent the day there. And then each 
bird, as, you'll see, as you probably saw in the exhibition, has these tags that essentially identify, this is something that you put on the bird immediately after yeah. it's been collected and has been prepared. Claro, like for example, we're here, they're seeing the oropendola that comes from Tabasco and from La Venta, which was something that also I was looking at specifically for some that would be of the region um, of where, you know, the birds of Moctezuma would have been from. Right. <coughs> and this is just a, a few images. This is the Arctic Turn here. Um, this is a wing, you can see the wingspan of a golden eagle, a bald eagle there. Our, our very last <laughs> idea for a specimen was to include a bald eagle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, bald eagles and the golden eagle um, live in Mexico and in the United States and, and they move freely through the borders. And in the end, um, actually we hatched this plan on the train over to DC. We thought, wouldn't it be so poetic to use those two birds as a representation of Rebecca? Um, and we were unsure if they would be willing to, to do that, but um, I wrote a very convincing letter. Uh, for every loan that we have, in any museum, you have to write something called a loan letter. And these are essentially love letters to whoever owns the objects, convincing them that um, you need to let us have these objects on view. And I had to write a very extensive love letter to natural history, partly because they were concerned that we would use the specimens as um, curiosities. And the first question they asked was, why do you need to have the actual specimen and why can't you just show a picture of it? And we had to really think about it. Um, and we really had to think about what was the purpose of having every single specimen. And, the multiples, num and right? then in multiples, And then in multiples, because it just mm -hmm. wasn't one, as, as you see, it's, it's multiple. Um, and, and it was hard. I mean, we really had to be thoughtful about it. And um, and then, you know, it was the, a sort of back and forth. I, I joked with Rebecca that I sent the letter. And I remember I wrote a few lines that I thought, this is a little too art speak. And I don't know if they're going to understand that. And sure enough, they highlighted it <laughs> in bold yellow and said, the scientists don't understand what you mean by this. Can you explain <laughs> further? <laughs> so even the process of of speaking to the another, ornithologists, another discipline, um, and another discipline was was also a learning curve um, for for us. I think Rebecca was was much more um, uh, eloquent in it because she had done so much work on birds already. Um, I was really coming at it from you know nowhere. I was really new to this. But really, I mean, those letters should be framed and they should be there because they really are this incredible extension and justification of why is it that this matter? We had to think because one is the story and the impulse. And then the other one is, well, if I want three or four or five or six of something, what is it that this multiple, multiple, Simplicity of them gives me that it's not just one. And we began to then see the different patterns in the, even within one species of how the design had variations. So it just, it was a beautiful way to have to think in terms of design about, you know, the bird specimens. We're, we're running out of time, but... Um, here's Martha. Here's Martha. Uh, before we left to get on the train before, uh, to head back to, to New York, we, we ran down quickly. We must have asked a hundred guards, where is Martha? Martha yes, exactly. We, we really had minutes. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I got this, this shot of Rebecca um, <laughs> gazing at Martha. Um, and then this just gives you a little bit of a sense of um, you know, how we go about uh, designing an exhibition. Rebecca is in LA. Uh, I'm obviously in New York. so. We communicated in, in these funny ways where I would send her plans, and then sometimes I would make a video explaining <laughs> those were beautiful. <laughs> explaining I the plans, them. and that's how we would communicate um, so that it was very clear. Um, but you know, it it took many tries, even making 
the, the mound for the quetzal uh, was a whole process. That's how they arrived, right? In That's their... how they're stored. Mm -hmm. um, they took them out to measure. Um, and this was this drawing that they made uh, for the case. And then even shooting the birds, we had to shoot the birds for, many of these birds had never been photographed. Um, they're just in a database and, you know, if a scientist needs it, just open up a drawer and pick it up. Um, but we needed to have them photographed for our website, for the brochure, and, um, and this one ended up being such a funny situation where all of the curators, pretty much the entire museum staff was, were, were, were there, kind of like, I want to see, but no, I don't want to see. Um, <laughs> and then um, we realized that because this was a mounted bird. A beauty shot. We needed. It is definitely the beauty <laughs> shot with the you know, metal thing here. It's like, look at all these people um, shooting this one bird. And then maybe we'll end with this and then open it up for questions. And then, yes, I wanted to speak just very quickly of the Erasmo Estrada yeah. oh, piece. Yes, yes let's talk too. about that one. So this one to me was a very difficult piece to see. First, you know, there was, uh, you have half the body of a hummingbird, uh, just beautifully mounted, of course, but that is with a ruby right in the eye. So it's the way in which, you know, we <clears throat> used to have and display the dead animal on you and feel that that was a, a status symbol. And I think that right now what is more and more, there's still some idiots that would actually still do that and wear it, but more and more we are realizing that that's not any more ethical, that we could just not, cannot display such uh, disregard for life. And I'll just add, this is part of a set with matching earrings. I know exactly, so you have a um, dead one and a dead one. And a dead one. <laughs> Um, our brochure that was beautifully designed by Rebecca as well. Um, oh, I love, and just very quickly, to me, that important piece over there is that um, the Pantone color system comes from, it is kind of evolves from Ridgeway's uh, color system of the, the ornithologists were basically taking every, naming every red however they wanted. So there was no unification of how to speak about the colors of the birds. So then he and his wife came up with this incredible. Robert Ridgeway was yes. a Smithsonian ornithologist. And um, as Rebecca said, he was incensed by the fact that other ornithologists were using so many different words to describe color. color of bird feathers. So he created this system. Um, it never took off. Uh, his wife pasted every single <gasps> color, uh, color block um, on every single page. And it was a flop but it really was the precedent of, of what we know now as the Pantone system, um, you know, imagined for birds. And then we'll, I'll skip forward to this. Yes, so this is a very interesting document that, and it was our last entry into the exhibition, and it is a document that um, uh, it depicts it's a legal case of, uh, that spans three centuries and that it is the, um, uh, again, legal case for an encomienda, uh, which is the, you know, giving land and from the conquest. So it gives giving land and uh, indigenous people and um, other goods from, you know, by the crown to people that came to the um, Spanish to the into Spanish colonizers, yes. So what is interesting about this document is that it also is, uh, this last document is written to the chief general of the country, then who happens to be my, grandf my uh, grand grandfather, and who Erasmo Estrada, is the document is, is for uh, Señor Estrada, and, um, it, and its descendants. So... Years, 320 years later, the first document begins in 1610, and the last one is 1930. And the, um, w the last descendant of the Estrada, Don Erasmo Estrada, it was uh, my great-grand-uncle. So both within the family, there is this connection 
down to Hernán Cortés, to the crown. And this document is the ways in which even just the idea, again, of the colonialism in terms of the encomienda that would be given. But um, my father and I and my mom were trying to decipher what it was said on each one of the documents. And you're really looking at the history that goes from the crown and the seals from the crown, and then it moves to the seals of Mexico, and uh, you know, from calligraphy all the way to um, machine, you know, the typewriter. What was interesting about this document was that Rebecca first told me about it on the train ride to DC. And she says, I'd really love to have these documents in the show. And I said, oh yeah, I, I, that's really interesting too, but um, how do we relate it to the show? <laughs> and, um, and we sort of talked about it a lot in passing until the summer. And, um, and during the summer, Rebecca says, Oh my God! I am related to the man to the to the Estrada family of which these legal documents pertain to, and just to give a bit of of a background in terms of the encomienda system, part of the way the Spanish got um, you know people to move to the New World um, was by promising them land um, and promise and and part of the land came indigenous people. And so some people were granted this land, and once you had the land, you had it for life. So your descendants had it, and you it would just continue through the family. But other people never got it. So perhaps you were promised an encomienda, but you never, and this was a case where it was not granted. It was not granted. And it's in the area of Tenancingo, and one can trace back the Estrada, family to the uh, letters of Cortes and that the legal case begins and it just never ever is granted so it really is you know and they talk about the usurped land and the usurped so if right now it's basically we are uh, as an art uh, intervention I will continue the case and I want it's basically like if I would be claiming Chicago right <laughs> it's about the size of the city that I would be claiming <laughs> Um, so it was a great way to sort of, it, in a way, connect the, what became the genesis of the show to, you know, the completion of oh, it. Um, yeah. Through the, genetics now. Through genetics. <laughs> she, you had no idea at the time. No. I just um, couldn't believe it, really. But then, yeah, I was, yeah. So um, should we open it up for yeah, questions? That would be wonderful. Yes. Questions. We're ready for questions. Anything. I think that we are at a point where we are yeah, needing to wrap up. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm very curious. You showed us a few runners up, so to speak, that didn't make it to the final round. Um, could you speak a little bit about getting closer to the end? What was the hard criteria? What was... Was there a checklist that said it has to be these three things and yeah. it doesn't quite fit that? Or clearly there's a whole narrative that we've, you've told us about the story, but what, what were, I'm curious to see what was, ah, no, it's to this and that therefore it can't be. That's such an interesting thing because there are definitely pieces that they had to be there because they felt like they were anchors to storytelling. And if you see, for example, we have them named as um, symbolized, objectified, feathered. So that was the kind of terminology that I thought that would be able to join and to make this feel like it's uh, you know, through nomenclature. A lot of times it's, it's a great system to unify something. Um, so. There were pieces, for example, we had many other kinds of, like the idea of the egg, right? That was one that, even though it felt that it was a nice thing to have the eggs of the birds, they weren't as important in terms of the story. So therefore, um, those were ones that began to kind of, you know, go away. It was um, a, a mixture of, mm -hmm. as Rebecca said, what what really could be anchors and um, hold up to the to the point of a certain section. Um, sometimes it was as simple as it wasn't in great condition, yeah. space, 
um, space became, you know, at Huge. the end it's space. And, and I remember I told Rebecca, we needed to cut a few objects. And every time we needed to cut an object, Rebecca would say, not another one of my babies. <laughs> exactly. Like I, they were all um, being the same were, baby. Yeah. <laughs> It was hard. It was very difficult because I had kind of fallen in love with the, with the flow and the relationship of one object to another and how they entered into dialogue. One of the things that for me was very hard to cut were um, uh, books of, like, for example, Cather Wood, that, that for me it would, would connect, it would link. Um, they didn't fit. Um, what else was I like really devastated? I, and right now I don't remember. But well, I told her you'll forget about it. Glad um. exactly <laughs> what she did, and it's good. I have forgotten. Um, yeah. And that's part of the curatorial process: is is making hard decisions um, and thinking about what is going to hold up to the point that you're trying to make, um, and that the visitor will understand. Um, we were telling a really multifaceted story, and so that's something that we asked ourselves a lot. Will, the, will this help the visitor understand this point or this section of the installation? Remember that we were trying to also get some feather works, like the skirt of feathers. I mean, those were things that it was just devastating not to get it because right. it was really the connection between the bird and the the, the object, and we we didn't have enough time. Well, we we hadn't given enough lead time to to the institution because they were coming from the National Museum of American Indian. Yeah, yeah. so that was devastating because it was like a beautiful uh, head piece that would connect it very yeah. closely with the penachos, and so that was that was tough to to lose. Um, yeah. I was really starting to think what we could hang from the ceiling. <laughs> she <laughs> <was> did. <laughs> <laughs> Until our exhibitions director said, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> 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 we don't drill into this building. Yeah. yeah, so that was... Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I was curious, you mentioned the words, and can you say more about, like, when did the words come through the process? Were you choosing things... I mean, I know how it could be back and forth, but I just wondered where, in your practice, where the words came from. You know what, I think that the words came when we were doing the publication. So those words you mean of that, that categorize them, yes, we needed to organize them for publication, for the brochure, and I f we felt that in the exhibition there were... Um, they were kind of like just fl almost like floating a little bit. But the moment that we came up with those names for the catalog, it made so much sense for them yeah. to be in the exhibition as well. So We had created kind of like sections yes. um, just to help organize ourselves. So we had mm -hmm. an America section, a feathers section, but they were just working terms, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but it was when we were making the brochure that I... I I said to Rebecca, well, I think you what really you need to create um, uh, titles or headings for these yeah. sections. And, um, and actually, I think she did it in such a poetic way, um, which was almost anti-curatorial in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was such an extension of her, her artistic practice. Yeah, and that was an exciting thing to be able to say. You know, it's just like feathered, symbolized, objectified. Um, and I forget yeah. the other ones, but they're there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have one more. Um, time for one more? Okay. Uh, extraordinary exhibit. Thank you so much. Thank you. As, as I know, you know, the, the tail feathers of the Quetzal were worth more than gold yeah. in Mesoamerica. Yeah. Um, and you could have gone in that direction and contrasted the values of the Spaniards with their obsession with gold versus... Moctezuma's aviary, but you didn't do that. And uh, what you did do was, in a sense, bring out the difference in values. Mo Moctezuma had this aviary and Cortez burnt it. Yeah. But w my, I guess my question is, is rather uh, what, what you omitted. In a sense, why did you decide uh, on uh, that particular way of saying those things. Yeah, yeah. So for example, in the headdresses of Moctezuma, 
the emperor was the only one that could actually wear the quetzal, and they never killed the bird. They pluck one feather only. And so that is something that, that's why it was scarce, and that's why it was gold, because you couldn't kill the bird. So I find that, um, indeed, I could have told that story. I think that maybe we forgot, but I, I know that for me it was an important thing of being able to say, well, of course, you know, there were, we all, everybody's kind of waiting for me to tell the story of the human sacrifice and the blood and all of that. But at the same time, I think that there was, a, to me, was much more the connection they had with the, with the earth and with the land. The fact that they were, the waters were purified through plants, and that they had the system of purifying their dark waters, or black waters, I don't know how you call them, um, through lilies, right, through passages. So that kind of connection that it wasn't the European way that you just threw your excrement down the street, right? I think that there was really something that was so incredibly uh, synergetic in terms of the natural world. Um, so I am sure I'm omitting things like, you know, the sacrifices and stuff, but I feel that that's uninteresting. Right, I think that um, that's the story that I don't care to tell. There are many stereotype stories about, um, yeah, our culture that it's perhaps they're a little tired. And for me, I try to look for alternative stories that might actually help us understand more the complexity of a culture. And so I hope that, um, but I do, I would have loved to perhaps tell that story of the Quetzal's feathers. <laughs> that would have been a nice one. It was in there, I forgot. About no. the plucking just one yes, feather? Yes, we did. We okay, did good. That, but we didn't. Yay. We, <laughs> <laughs> I forget. It's we good. didn't talk about um, its value. Yes, with yes, gold. exactly, with gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, other currency. Mm -hmm. yeah, very, one more. Yeah, the Go performance on. in North America was mainly with feathers. Feathers, skins, jade. Uh, honey and salt. So, but the feathers was very important uh, commerce that came from the southwest into the highlands of uh, Mexico, which is Tenochtitlan. So, so that trade was the uh, devastation. And what, what we are uh, Looking in your uh, exposition is the destruction of the environment, the destruction of the environment to kill the, the birds, and not only the birds, but all the animals that are suffering this destruction that we are doing is the same one that Cortez made at the time. And that choice, I mean, that's the key kind of moment of the choice, right? Uh, that for gold, you kill everything else, right? For like the, the gold that didn't have much value. I mean, it had value for the Aztecs, but not as much as value as life and as the beauty and as that, uh, yeah, the feathers. Oh, we need to kill this, yeah. But thank you for that question. <laughs> that was really good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank we have you. to wrap up. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rebecca. Stop. <laughs>